So I'm going to be talking about the new generation of data frames in Python. I think there's going to be a big change in the core, is that better? The core data processing tools happening in Python, and I'd love to see our community here in Ireland be part of that. Is that okay? So what I'll be covering is first why we want to switch from pandas in the first place. Um, second, I'll be introducing Apache Arrow, and then the three new data frame libraries, or newish libraries that I'll be talking about are Vakes, DuckDB, and Polars. We went on to become lead data scientist at Analytics Engines uh, in Belfast, and last year I kind of went freelance, set up my own company, and I've been doing things like training in high performance data science, and some consultancy, and I'm also an inveterate blogger, YouTuber, tweeter on new data science tools. So I'll, I'll be posting my kind of uh, links at, at the end. So the question one is like, Pandas has been the workhorse of the data processing world for 10 years, so why do we want to switch in the first place? Isn't this working okay? Well, we've known for a long time that there are issues with Pandas. This is a talk which will be 10 years old in, uh, in January, given by the Pandas creator, Wes McKinney and he called it in practice, 10 things I hate about pandas. So what things did he hate about pandas? Well, I'm not gonna go through them all, but the basic problems are one, that it's slow. Uh, the issue there is that a lot of stuff happens in serial rather than in parallel, and there's too much stuff happening in Python. Kind of heresy at a, a Python conference, but we all love Python, but we don't want it really to be doing too much of the work. We want Python as a, as a kind of API layer that then pushes down to more performant languages for the actual hard work. So pandas has too much stuff in Python. It's also memory inefficient. So the pandas developers give a rule of thumb that you might want 10 gig of RAM for a one gigabit, gigabyte data set if you're doing any kind of complicated um, queries. Second, or thirdly, there's no query planning. So you give pandas three or four lines of code um, and in general, it will go and just run those in sequence without looking ahead to see what's actually needed later in the query. And fourthly, it scales poorly. If your data set's larger than memory, you're kind of in charge of that yourself, if you're just using pandas, of actually being able to manage that and stream that through, through your data set. So there have been, these, these issues were obviously sort of identified 10 years ago, and there have been efforts to address them. So there's been things like more usage of Apache Arrow that I'll, I'll talk about in a minute, and that's led to a new problem, that there's an increasing amount of manual optimization required for working in pandas. For just to take one example, if you, and, and the issue is that many of the default options are the kind of legacy poor options. So you have to know, for example, that you shouldn't be using Pandas built-in CSV engine, you should be using the PyArrow engine. Same for how you handle different, different D-type columns and so on. So it places more and more onus on you to actually know that these things exist, to remember to implement them, and to implement them correctly. We'd really like a library that can just handle all that for us, takes the best practices, just stick, does it all, and let, lets us get on with our, with our life. One of the other ways that uh, the issues have been addressed is by this emerging ecosystem around pandas. So the original pandas setup was that you had pandas uh, is a, for your data frame stuff and it called NumPy then to do the, the processing. What, when I've suggested using Polars, one pandas expert said, but surely you can just use Modin. And here's your call stack if you use Modin. So you call Modin, which then calls Dask, which then calls either Python multiprocessing or multithreading, which then calls pandas, which then calls either NumPy or Arrow. So here's the, the new problem. You've got this huge sprawl of libraries, each with their own communities and kind of so user groups. And so if you want to then start improving things, you then have all this kind of fractured, uh, fractured, um, fractured uh, ecosystem. What we'll see with the libraries to talk about later is that they have one kind of really core uh, query engine and everything happens in that. And the pace of development and handling these issues has been much more rapid in those new libraries because they're dealing with one really tightly integrated uh, query engine. So how do we go about improving things? Well, the first step on the way to improving things was this, like, was this kind of idea called Apache Arrow. And I'm gonna introduce that first for anyone who's not familiar before talking about the data frame libraries. So Arrow confuses people, I think partly because if you look at the documentation, it's quite technical and, and complicated because it's not primarily designed as something you use day to day. And one of the confusion points arises because Arrow is really two things. On one hand, it's a standard for how you represent uh, columnar data in memory. And that means basically there's a document somewhere which says, okay, if you've got a string, uh, if you've got string data, you should arrange the bits like this. And if you've got this kind of data, this is how you should represent missing values, so on. It's just a set of, um, set, set of standards. And on the other hand, uh, on, so the idea of Ar Arrow is that it becomes a replacement for NumPy as the back end for tabular data. So you no longer have a pandas data frame with NumPy uh, array underneath. Instead, you have a data frame library with an arrow table underneath. 
The other idea of this standard is that it's language agnostic, so it's not a Python thing or it's not an R thing. It, these ideas should apply across the, the data science ecosystem. And, and then you can have a lot more interchange between all of these different libraries. So I said Arrow's two things. On one hand, it's a standard. And on the second, it's a set of libraries that implement that standard. And as Arrow is language agnostic, this, these libraries exist in a whole bunch of languages. C++ is the core one that the Arrow um, developers use, but there's also Java, .NET, Python, R, Go, Rust, JavaScript, etc., etc. Um, one point is that there, if you go onto the Apache Arrow GitHub, you see you will see all these these languages listed and the implementation. But if you want to go and just create your own library that implements the standard, but you don't agree with some detail of how the Arrow developers have done, you can create your own Arrow library, and that's what happened in the case of Polars that it builds upon an unofficial Arrow uh, Rust library that because the, the developers felt that the official implementation just hadn't handled some of the details in the way that was optimal for the, how they wanted to build a data frame library. So what Arrow kind of really functions as is a kind of Rosetta Stone for the data science ecosystem. So you can be working in Python, but if your query engine is in Rust or C++, that you can then work between these different things without needing to sort of serialize and deserialize your data and having to kind of rebuild your, your stack to handle different memory formats. So what are the benefits of Arrow? Well, for one thing, in terms of just using it itself, ignoring all the language agnostic and uh, interchange stuff, first, there's fast reading and writing. If you're familiar with Parquet files, uh, you can think of Parquet as being a compressed representation of an Arrow table on disk, and or you can think of an Arrow, uh, Arrow table as being a decompressed Parquet file in memory. So Arrow and Parquet have developed the hand in hand to kind of represent things in the same way so you get the fastest possible movement from disk into memory. Then there's this idea called zero copy across processes. If you're running in, in parallel, you can do it in two ways. You can use threads within a single process or you can use multiple processes. So threads work in the same process. They can all access the same things in memory, but you're restricted to being in that same process in a say a Python process. If you can do zero copy across processes, it means you can be working in Python. You've got your Python and uh, you've got your Python uh, Jupyter notebook, and you've got your uh, Arrow table there. But then, if your query engine is in Rust or C++, they can just go in and work in that object without having to copy it, so that they can do their their operations. So then, it opens up a lot more chances to use more kind of close to the metal um, languages in your data processing in Python. Then there's lots of other bits and pieces, like details like vectorized operations on CPU. So modern CPUs can do kind of forms of parallel operations. And so the Arrow specification kind of ensures that the way the data is laid out in memory will work for passing things into the cache efficiently and going from the cache into the CPU efficiently. And so you get speed ups from that. There's other, other aspects, for example, the missing data handling is sane in, uh, compared to in Pandas, which has ended up with a lot, uh, multiple different ways of handling missing data. In Arrow, missing data is null for all data types. There's also NANDs if you're working as a, a special floating point type, but missing data is just, just null. And then there's uh, efficient nested data types, and it keeps on developing to more of the features that we've learned that we need. So I'm not going to want to talk about the libraries now. And just this, before I get onto these three libraries, just brings me back to a kind of tweet I was putting out a, a little while ago. And I noticed that these three libraries, that none of them had come out of uh, VC money funded in Silicon Valley for all the billions that are poured into data processing. There, all three began in the Netherlands, and all, all three began as either academic or personal projects. So it just shows you the way these sort of big, big things can come very rapidly from the community. It's, uh, the, the tech world has definitely not gone over to the big money for, for many of the key ideas. So Vakes is the first library I'll talk about. Um, it, it was the, the oldest of these, and it kind of uh, functions as a bit of a kind of missing link between this pandas and some of the libraries that came that I'll talk about later. Um, so Vegas has a deep space origin. It came from astronomy researchers, and they had these very big tabular data sets. Um, initially, it had a NumPy backend, but then as Arrow developed, they moved to, uh, uh, moved to a hybrid NumPy Arrow backend. And the problem they had was parsing data from large HDF5 uh, files. And HDF5 is kind of a nice format to work with. It's a bit like Parquet in the, uh, in the sense that it stores metadata, so you can often do kind of clever things to process these large data sets. Um, compared to, say, a CSV, where you're just restricted to just processing everything, processing everything line by line. So it works really well. And in a couple of years ago, they were doing talks showing very impressive performance on these data sets with like doing group buys on a billion rows a second and so on. 
The issue is that it works really well in that use case. If you're just working with CSV or Parquet, a lot of people found that it's not actually that impressive, may even be slower than, than Pandas. And so uh, I think they, they really optimize for their use case. And I think the community around it is developing focused on that, that HDF5 use case, but I don't see it becoming the kind of mainstream Pandas replacement. The next contender to come along was DuckDB. And this came out of the database world. So this came out of researchers in Amsterdam. And these are computer science researchers who focus on databases. And if you need to know three words about DuckDB, it's SQLite for analytics. So if you're familiar with SQLite, it's an embedded database. That means it's basically just a small binary file that stores all the code, and then, it's, then you've got a file format, either its own native file format or something like a CSV or Parquet file. That's in contrast to traditional um, databases like MySQL and Postgres that have this kind of client-server approach where you've the, the database is running on a server, and then when you talk to it, you're kind of like pinging kind of HTTP requests at it. Instead, this is a simpler, just a, uh, a binary file. The query engine is written in C++. Um, it's, a, it's in database world, so it, you kind of speak to it in SQL, although they're developing a Python API, like, well, a, an actual Pandas-style API. It does the things you'd hope that a database would do, such as has a query optimizer to look at your query and, and kind of try to improve things. And it can handle larger than memory streaming. So if you've got 10 gig of RAM and a 40 gig data set, DuckDB can handle that. And it's developed support for things like CSV files and Parquet. The difference with SQLite, by the way, is that SQLite, like most traditional databases, is row-oriented, so it stores everything row by row, whereas DuckDB is more like Pandas and um, so analytics tools, where everything is stored column by column, because that's what you want if you're doing, say, a group by, and you've got to parse a column and get all the, get all the keys. Uh, that's the way. So if you're just doing analytics-style work, uh, workflows, that it's much faster than something like SQLite, because it's just built for it. Um, and the other thing that they, the, uh, the big integration they've made is that uh, they put in, the, in their blog post, DuckDB quacks arrow. So they kind of play on this duck stuff a lot um, for the developers. The idea here is that the internal memory representation for DuckDB isn't Apache arrow. They've got their own internal memory representation, but they can ingest the arrow data with zero copy and apply their queries on it. So if you have the kind of arrow table in your Python thing, you can call, as we'll see in a, in a few minutes actually, you can call kind of your SQL query through DuckDB on that, and it doesn't have to take your whole data set and copy it in and then copy it out again. It can just, without, without doing copy, take in your, your data set that you've read in from Parquet via arrow. Finally, come on to Polars. Um, so the, there's a bit of a clue in the way this, um, this title is done here. So if you notice, the RS is in a different color. So the convention among um, Rust developers is that Rust files are called .rs. So it was a bit of a play that is going from pandas to a different bear to, to polars, and it incorporated this little rs to show that this is very much a Rust data frame library. So polars originated as a lockdown project. Uh, a guy in the Netherlands called Richie Vink. He was very bored at home during lockdown, so he's, he's, he was a Rust developer, worked on Arrow in Rust as well, and thought, you know, it'd be great if we had data frames in Rust. And he felt that he could do a lot better than Pandas and address a lot of the issues that Wes McKinney had spelled out in the 10 things I had about Pandas. And he really kind of achieved with that. So one thing about it is that this is a Rust library with a Python API. So just to kind of illustrate this as a call tree, this is a very thin Python API. When, you, when you're working this in Python, it, you're really feeling like, like Pandas with a better syntax. But when you, when you call your operations, you're really in the Python scripts. You're, by and large, you're just parsing the arguments and passing them straight to Rust that there's no deep layer of stuff happening in Python like there is in, in Pandas before you actually get to the computation. Um, it has a full, uh, it's a full arrow backend, so the, the, the data frame is an arrow table underneath the hood that there's no other kind of complicated thing happening. It has a query optimizer, as we'll see in a minute, takes in your full query, looks at it, and sees if it can find any nice optimizations. As of yesterday, it handles larger than memory streaming, so you can do kind of sort of 100 gigabytes on your on your laptop, and it'll kind of for for the core operations, and it'll it'll parse that, and works with a whole bunch of different file types. So, what about community adoption for these tools? Before we look at some code, so this chart's going back to 2016. The yellow line is Vigs, was the first one to get going, and from 2019, it started getting some traction and started started growing in popularity. But you can see that. In the, sorry, this the metric here is GitHub stars which is just a way of measuring are people actually kind of excited, because um, it's hard to actually know how many people are really using these libraries. So Vex was getting a lot of uh, kind of attention around 2019, 2020, when it was really the only kind of mainstream alternative to Pandas. 
but that growth has kind of trailed off as I think other kind of rivals which are really more optimized for the, the task at hand have emerged. Um, DuckDB is in red, which started growing fast through 2020, and especially in 2021 and recently. I think they've really kind of figured out to have a better, initially it was really just like SQLite and very much like a, a SQL tool and database tool, but they've kind of improved in terms of their uh, functionality within Python and R in the last couple of years, which is why their um, popularity has been growing. And then Polars, Polars, which started mid-2020 with its first commit as this lockdown project, and then it's really just been kind of exploding in popularity. And um, I can even see from, although the, this has been kind of continual growth, I've, I've made some YouTube videos which only have huge views, but I could see in the last few months that just the, there's been a lot of growth in terms of how people are, are interested in Polars. So uh, let's see some code to see how these things actually work in practice. Uh, so I'll come out of this. So just going to do a quick demonstration here. Uh, we're going to need some imports. So we import Polars as PL, DuckDB like this. <laughs> And in this case, we're also going to need um, the PyArrow Parquet Reader, which sometimes happens with, um, with DuckDB. Uh, the data set we're going to work with is just this fake data set that's been invented for, uh, for benchmarking purposes. And it's supposed to be some kind of like generic manufacturer style, style thing. And so the columns we're interested in are this ID for different parts, which is a kind of integer ID. And then we have this quantity and extended price. We're going to do group by on, the, on this ID and then do some aggregations on these columns. So I'll do a comparison in a moment, but I'm just going to break down the, the syntax a little bit here for, for Polars back in the, uh, in the presentation. So here's the Polars uh, query. So we'll do it line by line. So first thing we hear, see here is Polars scan parquet. This isn't read parquet, this is a scan parquet. What this does is tell Polars that we're working in lazy mode. So it's not going to run off and start reading the parquet file as soon as it gets to this line. All it'll do at this point, actually, is open the parquet file, check it's there, check the column names, check some metadata, all things that can happen in a, a very short period of time. Then we proceed with the query. And as we build a query, what we're really building here, because we're in lazy mode, is a query graph. We build this query line by line. And then whenever we trigger evaluation, Polarge goes and optimizes that query. So then it can see if it can run the, the fastest version of it. So we're in lazy mode, because we call scan parquet. And then the next operation is going to be group by. So Polars has a very, everything in Polars is parallelized. And this is the advantage of having this really tight kind of query engine that you can really control where parallelization happens. So it has this fast algorithm for multi-threading, building up the group by hash table. And then it uses these things called expressions. So inside here, you can see pl.call. That tells Polars, look for this column in the data set. And in this case, call the mean on it. And you can do lots of really, well, arbitrarily complicated um, transformations using this syntax. The key thing to understand here is that this is really, you should think of it as more like a part of a SQL statement. This is, a, a, this is a, an instruction to the Rust query engine. There's nothing really happening in terms of Python code here. This is just, in terms of Python, this just adds this to the query graph. It's, it's not actually running in Python. We've got a list of aggregations here. And when you do that, Polarge first gets the group by keys in parallel. And then it'll do all your aggregations in parallel. So this is where parallelization is really built in um, the whole way through. And finally, you call collect. And collect says, OK, go and run this query and actually optimize it and then evaluate it. And as of yesterday, if you pass a, an additional argument of allow streaming in here, then it'll also try and do that as in a streaming fashion. So it won't try and read everything in in one go. It'll try to figure out what sort of chunks it needs to read things in and then process it chunk-wise like that. Okay. So that's the, the Polar um, query here. Uh, so we can run that. And then I look, we look here at the, at the DuckDB query. So this will be familiar for anyone who's worked with SQLite in Python. So the first thing you have to do is kind of spin up DuckDB by creating an in-memory in database. In this case, uh, DuckDB didn't support the, the compression that I had used on the Parquet file. Uh, on, on the Parquet file. So instead of using uh, DuckDB just directly reading the Parquet file, I'm going to read it in um, using, uh, using the PyArrow Parquet and then just pass that object via the kind of zero copy stuff into DuckDB. So we use uh, PyArrow and tell it just to read this table and it's reading the same file. Here's the start of what we're telling um, DuckDB to do. So like SQLite, you say connection.execute and you give it a SQL query. And it's a fairly standard SQL query where we're saying we're going to group by this column and take the mean of, of these two. And one of the neat things is here, you see it says from arrow table, this is the name of the variable. So you just put the name of the variable into the string, and that's how DuckDB knows, uh, knows what to do. 
So that's, DuckDB is going to execute that, but we want that back in, in Python, and it has a method for uh, returning the output as a pandas data frame, but as I've been saying, that pandas data frames aren't that efficient. So what you can do instead is return the, the data as an arrow table, and because Polars is arrow, arrow based, you can just call Polars from arrow. So we're going to return the output actually as a Polars data frame and not have to do any copying and any transformation that we might have to do with, uh, with pandas. Uh, so we're going to run that, and then we do a quick comparison on a larger data set. So we'll run it for Polars first, and generally takes about seven or eight seconds. Ten seconds this case. And if we run it for DuckDB, it's going to be slower in this case. It's normally about 25 seconds. And that's, so generally there's not much performance difference between these two libraries. They're both really kind of optimized and, and pretty much as fast as you get. The reason there's a performance difference in this case is that with Polars, the query optimization in this case, so I'll uh, let that finish in a moment. The query optimization in this case was that we're only actually interested in three columns from the data set the key column for the group by and the two columns that we aggregate. So when you run that, that query in Polars, it spots that only three columns are relevant. So when it reads from the parquet file, it only reads those three columns. However, with, because we've just read the, read the file here in, in, in PyArro and then passed that, that kind of pointer into, um, into DuckDB, the, the query optimizer in DuckDB hasn't been able to see that it doesn't need to read all the columns. So in this case, it takes twice as long. And that's because in this case, it's reading all the columns in the data set because the query optimization isn't being passed the full way through the query. We could kind of address that by kind of adding in kind of an option here for the column names that we're actually interested in. So we have to do a bit of manual optimization and then the performance would be quite similar between them. So that's the basic of how, how it works. Um, And the other question is, okay, so is, you have to really choose your, choose your sides here, one or the other. As we've seen here, because of Apache Arrow, that you, don't, you aren't necessarily limited to choosing one or, one or other of these libraries. Because you can pass around these arrow objects, not have to copy data between them, that you can actually use both. So if you find, like I do, that Polars is your great tool for, for most tasks, but there's something, some kind of database functionality, like building indexes or something, that it doesn't have, then you can just pass that as an arrow table into DuckDB and then kind of work with DuckDB like that. So don't feel like you have to kind of focus just on one, one aspect of the technology. Okay, so that's kind of the, the introduction. So now it's a question of what are the next steps? Well, I would say the first step for everyone should be to pip install Polars and DuckDB. And with both these libraries, I would recommend reinstalling them, them frequently because the pace of development is so uh, incredible. Um, if you get stuck, um, ask questions on Discord. Both libraries have very active Discord servers and uh, Stack Overflow and kind of really encourage everyone to put your questions on there and you know, the developers in, in Polars, we kind of watch Stack Overflow very quickly and try to make sure everything gets answered. You could also get involved in Contribute. It's been a really positive experience for me and if you want to talk about how you do that with Polars, um, I would really be happy to chat about that. Um, I tweet kind of almost every day about Polar stuff and um, about new functionality and watching the kind of new pull requests that come through and kind of things that maybe aren't in documentation uh, that are exciting and that kind of tips that I've learned from, from working with the library. Um, if you love cross-posting, follow me on Twitter and connect on LinkedIn because uh, everything goes on one or the other. Uh, I've been making some YouTube videos which kind of set out kind of some of the ideas I've been doing here and be making more in the months to come. Um, I do workshops. I'll be doing one at UCD in January. Uh, I'm just trying to confirm that, but happy to come anywhere else. Or if you really want to get up to speed on Polars quickly, I've created the first online course on anything in the kind of Apache Arrow system, and it's a data analysis with Polars course. Um, went online a few weeks ago, developing very rapidly, kind of in line with the library. And I certainly think that this is very much the fastest way to get up to speed with, uh, with this. 